now it's going on. <laughs> OK. So as I was saying, there's a lot of people who actually worked on these uh, questions of potential migration throughout the lifetime of foraminifera already several decades ago. And there were already some uh, reply towards all that. Um, so there is, for example, these two papers here that said that planktonic foraminifera do contribute to the diovertical migration. And this was based on the observation of higher concentration at specific moments in time and lower concentration at specific moments in time at a similar station. Then we have other research who said that planktonic foraminifera depth habitat could be seasonal and that it would be linked to species-specific reproductive trajectories. And then finally, we have a lot of other papers that would say that planktonic foraminifera do follow a trajectory of ontogenetic vertical migration that is also synchronized with the lunar cycle. So now that we see all that, we tend to think that all these um, questions were answered, that we know all that very well, and we just have to implement that in our interpretation of the geochemical signal. But then more recently, there were other publications that are actually challenging a bit some of these um, reply. It was the case of this paper from Michael Zika in 2012, talking about patchiness in foraminifera distribution rather than uh, geonal vertical migration and actually bringing for one of the first time the idea that this patchiness could actually explain our um, supposition or thought that they could contribute to the day of vertical migration. And then there were this other paper from Clara Mano and her colleague on Pachyderma saying that in the midnight sun, the species Pachyderma doesn't migrate uh, on a daylight, on a day night basis. And some people would say, okay, but it's because there were light all the time. But actually for others who planktonic organisms, whether there is light or no light at all, the species will continue to migrate because it's related to kind of an internal clock. So basically what I wanted to do or what I'm trying to do since um, four or five years or even a bit more now is to reopen some of these questions some decades later now and see if we can either provide a more robust answer to these questions or a more um, information number. So if they do contribute to these migrations pattern, how many of the population or what is the percentage of the population that would do that or not? So the three questions that I do have um, would be do planktonic foraminifera really take part in the diovertical migration, yes or no? Are they following a trajectory of ontogenetic vertical migration? And uh, to try to answer these observations of patchiness that some authors seem to have observed in the past, are the various reproduction modes that do exist in foraminifera the potential missing part of the puzzle for all that? And to answer all that, so I will start by talking about the first point on the first question. We did a cruise in 2017 on board of the Meteor and we went to the North Atlantic Ocean. And what you see in blue here is actually the cruise track that we followed. And we stopped at this point here, our station M3. And at this exact station, we stayed for 26 hours. And during 26 continuous hours, we deployed plankton toes several times, 41 times. And it was a multinet, so 41 times we could collect five plankton toes in a very small uh, research area of 400 square kilometers. So if we zoom in M3, this is here the track that we followed and basically every point represents one of the stations that we sampled. And from all these uh, plankton samples, we counted all the foraminifera, no split, to be sure that we really did count every single specimens that were there and that we're not missing anything, um, introducing any bias with the split. And then to make sure that um, there were dial vertical migration in the ocean, uh, at least for some of um, the others who plankton in group, we also used an ADCP echogram that would show us the occurrence of the event for a larger zooplankton. So here you have the depth and it's with time, it's at the same uh, area. And what it shows is that uh, we have an intense signal with the clear color, the bright color at the surface during the night here. And then between uh, four and eight in the morning, a part of the population will migrate in depth to about 300 meter depth. And then once the night uh, comes back, they will go back to the surface where they will feed. So now that we know that others in plankton are doing that, we can really try to see if the forums were following the same track or not. 
So we basically use the exact same of graphical representation, same depth interval and time. And we looked at the abundances of uh, foraminifera in the water column. So here again, we have the depth. Yep. We have uh, the distance between the station and we also have the time. What I put in a striped area here is the period of nights and here it shows the number of specimens per cubic meter. And what we see is that with time, we have no pattern of migration. So we cannot see a deepening and then a lot of uh, abundances or a lot of forms staying in depth and then coming back to the surface. But we rather see a big cloud of form that remains in the surface water with uh, patches of higher concentration. And this is now for all the species of forum together. So one could also think that maybe yeah, one can also think that maybe we had um, different species having different behavior and that we're hiding the signal for them. So we uh, split that per species and we looked um, at the same representation again per species with Siphonifera, Fleischeri, Universa, uh, Rubaraldus, and all that. And again, what we see is that there is no specific pattern of vertical migration, or at least no big vertical migration with big depth interval, but rather uh, stable depth habitats. And it's particularly clear for these three species here, and clear and interesting for Universa that's very clearly living more in depth, but at something that's pretty stable. And on top of that, what we tend to see at a scale of the population, but also on the species scale, would be this very high patchiness with patches of very high concentration, really located next to patches of very low concentration. And just as a reminder, we were in a very confined area of 400 square kilometers. So now we can really answer this question, at least for the open ocean, North Atlantic Ocean, saying that no, we couldn't see um, any dio vertical migration, or at least none that would occur at uh, depth intervals or depth viability that could have a drastic impact on the geochemical signal. So that's pretty good news. We could really observe some stable specific, uh, species specific depth habitats, which was also good news. And then we could see this very intense phenomenon of patchiness uh, on this scale of 400 square kilometers that was, as I said, previously described by other um, authors, including um, Zika in 2012. So the second question that we want to ask is if foraminifera are following a trajectory of ontogenetic vertical migration. So during this migration uh, during uh, their lifetime. And here I show a scheme that's published in the blue book of Ralf Schiebel and Christophe M. Neven that was published in 2017. And some of you might know it as the update of the green book that uh, we, I think most of us read or looked at. And actually, this book is based on a lot of information from the literature on the experience of the authors themselves. And they have this scheme that would suggest that all these species that you see here would reproduce on a synergic lunar cycle, that rhubarb would tend to reproduce on a biweekly cycle, and that other species of truncatulinoides would have a longer life cycle um, that would uh, also have a pattern of ascending in the water column or uh, descending as this one. So basically going in the pycnoclin or in the deep profile maximum to release their gamete and then having again a pattern of um, reascending the water column once the form are growing basically. And to observe that, um, actually a lot of authors worked with what we call the, regi the residuals. So here I show figures that were published in many papers from Yellow Bima in the 90s. And Ralph Shiba also used that, um, or this type of representation for Buloides and same other authors at about the same period of time used this representation. And it's actually by using this um, data interpretation or this data messaging in a way that they could see a signal that would suggest that there is some synchronicity in the reproduction and that there is a vertical migration of the specimens for the reproduction or linked to the reproduction. And these resi residuals, to briefly explain that, it's basically a graphical representation of the other representation of specimen within a size class. So here you have the size uh, of the different specimens versus uh, the time, so with the full moon, so full moon, full moon, or in depth. 
or an under representation when we are in the white area of um, the specimen, again, in a size class and for a specific depth. And what this tells us is that we actually here for this species, so Sacrifer, at the beginning or straight after the full moon, we really have this overrepresentation of small specimens that will tend to grow up this time until just before the full moon, where they have the larger size they could have. And we think that at this moment, they would release the gamut that would then repopulate the environment as being very small uh, form after gamete fusion. And this gametogenesis in uh, synchronicity would actually really help the gametes fuse or give them more chance to encounter in the ocean and then generate um, offspring. So here, that's really the pattern that they show with time. And then with depth, they also see that more of the small specimens are located in really shallow environments and that these specimens getting bigger will go deeper in the ocean. Where again, they would in theory release the gametes that would then reascend um, the water column or encounter and reascend the water column. So I thought that um, the best way to try and see with our data, if we could see the same thing or any similar, would be to do the exact same of data processing. So during the same cruise, as I briefly talked about before, so still in the North Atlantic Ocean, next to this M3 26 hour sampling area, we also collected plankton toes on a daily basis for about two weeks. And every single time we had these five nets, and we again counted all the foraminifera that we had. We deployed um, some CTD for every station or before every station, which uh, let me know and let us know that all of the stations were actually in very similar environmental conditions. And then once we had counted and picked out all the forums, we did size measurement uh, for four species of foraminifera that would represent the three main plates. And here I just show how we did that. So we managed to place them on slide and we looked at them individually to have a good idea of the size of all the specimens we would see at every depth for every single one of these stations. And then we used the data treatment of our colleagues, so this residual technique. And our results for the residuals is what I show here. So in terms of color code, what was in gray for our colleagues before would be in red for me, and what was in white would be in blue for me. So what we see in red here in the more red area would be the other representation here for an RGI of specimen with a large shell because I'm in the large size fraction. And then when we go in time, because here what we have on the y-axis is actually my stations that also reflect time day by day. And we see that we leave this very big overrepresentation of large specimen to, by the end of the sampling, have an overrepresentation of very small specimen uh, by the new moon here. And it's actually kind of similar if we look at the trajectory for Yuba Ruba and was kind of similar for Gutinata for at least part of the population. And if we look at what's happening in depth also with this overrepresentation of specimens per size class. Then we see that for Gucinata, the smaller individuals were located in the shallow water or shallower water, and that the larger shell then would tend to appear more in depth. And if we actually put um, a graphical um, interpretation of that, then what we see is what our colleagues uh, described, at least for a part of the population. Because as you can see on my graph, it's not perfectly clear, it's not perfectly red here with a beautiful trajectory. It's a mix of blue and red that we have to go through. But basically we would have this adult specimen that would release gametes. And then by the middle of the sampling time or by the end of it, we would have the overrepresentation of small specimens um, as a result of this event of gametogenesis. So this would vouch for the fact that we indeed have a synchronous reproduction in the open ocean or at least in this part of the Atlantic Ocean with a pattern of vertical migration. But as I said, it's far from being clear, which means that it's not followed by the entire population. So I also, in this paper, calculate the amount of the population that would take part in this migration or not. And it resulted in quite a small fraction that actually really do take part in all that. So roughly, when we look at all species, it's actually less than 50% of the foraminifera population that will contribute to this synchronous reproduction and that would also follow this vertical migration um, with the ontogeny. 
So if we want to answer this second question, or for Aminfa following the trajectory of ontogenetic vertical migration, then our reply from this data would be yes and no. So the good thing is that our data really help us understand how our colleagues already decades ago could identify this pattern that's really offering as a background signal all the time. So there's really this small part of the population that tends or that appears to reproduce this way. But then on top of that, we have a large part of the population that's more than 50% that doesn't follow this uh, trajectory. So the question now is what are the other doing? And one of the first replies that they can just die without reproducing. So very often we tend to hear that uh, foraminifera only die through reproduction and that every empty shell that we find, um, it's because the foraminifera underwent uh, gametogenesis or reproduced in a way, but they can very well die without any reproductive background. And or they could also reproduce differently and reproduce asexually. So we know since uh, 2006, thanks to our Japanese colleague, that Thoramnifa can also reproduce asexually, but it was never clear if it's um, something that's robust, that's occurring quite regularly or not. So after this observation on Pachyderma, then Haruka Takagi in Japan as well had an observation of asexual reproduction um, on Uvula. And Kate Davis and her colleagues also had a reproductive event, a sexual reproductive event um, with Pachyderma. So we know that it's occurring, but we don't know how much. And that was actually interesting for me because um, in 2019, I started, or 2018, I started to cultivate for Anifera myself and be interested in their reproductive behavior. So when I saw that, I thought that it was really something that we had to do now, focus on the reproductive strategy of for Anifera to try and understand it. This is just happening every now and then, and it's almost a mistake in a way, or if it's really something that's occurring a lot. So I worked on the reproductive mode of Pachyderma, and to do that in 2019, I was um, in a cruise in the Scotia Sea with colleagues from the British Antarctic Survey, and we collected uh, specimens for a culture, and out of this culture, I placed some, especially on the side, to look at their reproductive behavior. And because I know, or we know that several genotypes of Pachyderma inhibit this water, sure. we also collected, or I also collected specimens to do DNA analysis. And my colleague, uh, Rafael Mora, did the DNA analysis on this specimen, who showed that all four amnifera that we picked here at several stations all belong to the type four. So I knew in which population I was in case anything special was happening with the reproduction. And then last year in 2021, I took a place where I contributed in a cruise to the Greenland Sea with colleagues from Norway. And again, we placed a lot of specimen in culture, this time really specifically for reproductive observations. And we know that in this area, normally we only have the type one of Pachyderma, but we still collected for Amnifera to get uh, DNA sequences and be sure that we're working with a specific population. And once I had all these specimens in culture, whether it was in the Greenland Sea or in the Scotia Sea, I worked with them already on board. So I already placed them in the conditions that I wanted them to be and that were just mimicking their environment. And I followed them very carefully. So I checked um, if, they were, okay, if they were really active. So here you see one with nice residual activity that's also moving and very healthy. And then I was also checking if they were eating the food that I gave them, because I decided to give them some artemia, but also some green algae, because it was way easier, and I had a lot of specimen to feed um, every day. So once I knew that, I was taking notes of all that, how healthy they were, and I was also taking notes on any reproductive event or death event that I would see. So here you have two images of events of gametogenesis. This one is an event of gametogenesis that is happening. So what we see here is not a chamber, but actually a gametogenesis bulge. So this is here full of gametes and the kind of cloud that you see, it's also gametes that are getting out. And this is the same thing quite sometimes after. So this is why you don't have such a nice cloud anymore. But basically all the little bits that you see um, comes from this event of gametogenesis. And I had several of them both in the Scotia Sea and in the Greenland Sea. And then I also had event of asexual reproduction. So I had one in the Scotia Sea and I had six um, in the Greenland Sea, which was very surprising, but also 
super, super nice to look at um, because then these parental shell actually really is about a hundred specimen. That's what um, all the other authors who also saw that uh, reported. And then because I had many events and not just one, I had this um, repeatability in my observations, then I could count the number of offspring and I could look at their uh, shells. So look at the size of the offspring. So I looked at the size of the proloculus for all of them, because we know from the benthic community that um, there is a dimorphism in the shell between foraminifera reproducing sexually or asexually. And we know that the asexually spawned uh, specimens tend to have a larger proloculus than the one that were generated via gametogenesis. So I measured all the proloculus that I could, and I have a median size of the proloculus of about 25 micrometer, which is pretty large for pachyderma. And based on that, then I wanted to know if I could also look at these proloculus in the natural population. So I took the plankton tools that I had collected at the same time as I was collecting form for my culture. And then I measured the proloculus size of hundreds and hundreds of shells for um, the Greenland Sea, as we see here, from sample from the Buffin Bay that we had already in the lab, and then from the Scotia Sea. So here I know I was working with specimens from the type one of Pachyderma and here specimens from the type four. So I was confident I was with the same uh, population. And to measure the proloculus, I placed them all nicely um, in dorsal view, and I slightly covered them with oil to have shiny shell that would allow me to very clearly see the size of the initial chamber, measure it, and take notes of it. And then I also did some stats um, on this distribution. You could see that systematically, wherever the population I was with, I had um, a significant bimodality in the distribution. And that also shows that most of the population actually tend to have a larger proloculus which would suggest that the most of the adult form or the one that we can collect with the plankton tool could be the result of asexual reproduction and not necessarily of sexual reproduction that we always thought to be the dominant thing um, in the environment or the dominant thing in the environment. And gathering all the information from my culture and from this institute population, I made this model, a uh, reproductive model for N. pachyderma. And here it's the population that I talked about on which I measured the size of the proloculus. And that tells me that the majority of the specimen in the environment have a large one. So about 80% from my observations on pachyderma. And the minority in the environment of the adjuncts that we collect with the two have a microspheric one, so about 20%. And it's from this population that I collected the form that I placed in culture. And from this culture, I could see that 3% of them will reproduce or reproduce asexually, that 43% of them released gametes, and that more than 50% of them actually died without any reproductive event. So I thought that was very interesting because if we go back to the previous questions that we had, and if we again ask this question, are the reproductive mode, are the reproductive pathway and the life strategy or the life trajectories of the foraminifera, the potential missing part of the puzzle, then we actually see that from what I did before, from the paper of 2021 and from my research in Pachyderma, that's about 50% of the forum we have, not more, can die without reproduction. So these forum will die, go there, and actually they don't have or they will not follow any ontogenetic vertical migration trajectory because they don't have to. Then we also saw that a uh, bit less than 50% of the foraminifera were contributing or following this canonical path. And that's also confirmed by the observations that I had on pachyderma in culture, where I could only see or see about 43% of the foraminifera reproducing via gametogenesis. So it would suggest that this 43% or less than 50% have to really do this track or at least um, release their gamete at the same time if they want to make sure the gamete encounter at one point to create the next generation. And then finally, I could see that about 3% of my form uh, in culture for pachyderma reproduced asexually. So here it's a drawing of glutinata, but what I observed was for pachyderma, it's just to make the thing easier to understand. Um, but basically, when I looked then at the size of the proloculus in the natural population, what it showed is that most of this population that was large enough to be sampled probably was found via asexual reproduction. So these 3% are potentially 
a small part of what's happening in terms of food production, but it could be that they have the potential to make most of what we see in the ocean. And because it's uh, most of what we see in the ocean, and because they release about a hundred specimens when they do asexual reproduction, and because we know now that these specimens can live pretty well, they are pretty robust, they can live quite long, then it could also explain um, the phenomenon of patchiness that we see, because they would release this offspring irrespective of the time. So that would explain that sometimes we have maybe less uh, specimen in the water column than at some period of time or some very shortly after a lot of them, and that it acts in bubble like that because we would have less dispersion. So this is all um, still at the stage of food for thought, and we still have to obviously continue working on all that. But um, I thought that was interesting observations, and I'm very happy to hear what you have to say and take any questions. And on a very final note, I also take this opportunity to draw your attention on the fact that um, in November, we will host the, the annual conference of the GMS in Bremen. So I hope that we will see many of you there. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Julie, for the presentation. And uh, we have time for questions. We have one question in the chat already. And uh, that is by Howie. Howie, if you want, you can, you can ask your question directly. I think it relates to the observations of the vertical migration, right? Yeah, hi. Hi, Michael. Uh, Julie, wonderful talk. Wow, that was great. Um, so, my, I, actually, I had, there's one question I wrote down, but I was thinking about, I was just about to type out another. Uh, the question I had asked was, in showing your plots of the um, migration, or basically the distribution of forams in the water column from the plankton toes, how did that compare to the temperature structure of the water column? Okay, well, we're looking at a, at a, deep, at a mixed layer where, um, where we see, you know, the sort of the congregation in the cartoon is that due to uh, the fact that you're starting to get into the upper part of the picnicline, the, the temperature-based picnicline. Yeah, so I actually checked if we had um, any relation with that. So I, um, I try to see if there were a correlation between the depth at which I was I would observe most of my forums or the larger one and the thermocline. And it wasn't really the case. I never really had a drastic relation through that. So it's partly explained in the paper, but I was really trying to see that. So if we had any signal with this picnocline or a deep floating maximum or a thermocline, but there is nothing that I could see. Okay. Julie, can I ask you one more question? Sure. Uh, this and, and leave the leave this plot up. This leave this um, image up. So this is an idealized image of the obviously of the the life cycle of a of a planktonic foram, but the geochemistry of say species like Ruber and Seculifer don't support this. Okay, and they don't support this in the sense that we know that that uh, the the largest Seculifer and the largest Ruber have a very high delta C thirteen value which based on all the laboratory experiments that my group and others have done um, would, would argue for the highest light environment, the most photosynthesis by the symbionts. So I, I'd like to all offer an alternative competing hypothesis that at any given moment in time, you have a distribution of foraminifera that are growing in the water column with the largest or up near the surface. And as you move down in the water column, they get smaller and smaller simply because they're not attaining that largest size. And then at some point there's, when an, org when an individual is ready to undergo gametogenesis, there's a rapid drop into this lower region of the water column, which would include the large forearms and the small forearms. Okay, but they actually, the largest ones actually spent their time highest in the water column. Okay, and then drop very rapidly. So you're catching this at Yella. Yella and I have talked about this in the past from his work in the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. So you're catching sort of a uh, basically a static picture of a dynamic situation. So anyway, I just wanted to suggest that it's not as simple as small 
bigger, largest, deeper in the water column, but it's actually flipped. The largest are up near the surface and they get smaller as they go down in the water column. And then they all wind up down at that reproductive depth. Yeah, no, I think that's super interesting. And I obviously agree. I think there are loads of uh, potential explanation to any pattern we could see. And I have to say that when we started using the data and looking at the data, we just made a lot of abundances and then we couldn't see anything. And this is where we're like, okay, but maybe there is another way to try and see like how come so many people could see something and there's just nothing at all. So the way to see if we can also potentially see a signal is really to use the same data messaging. So that's why we talked with Yellow and he was super helpful in helping us with the graph and understanding how they would do this visualization of everything. And we were super surprised to see that we could see this other representation at specific moment in time. And yeah, we're also working with um, high resolution trap samples. And I have to say that, yeah, some of the things that we see for some of the species also tend to hint at this um, synchronicity. So again, I think there is some synchronicity, but I wouldn't go as far as saying it's systematically in phase with a lunar cycle, but there is still something probably that's happening. And for the depths, the same, I wouldn't go as far as to say they all do this or that. I think it's, um, as you said, by luck, or it's also because of physiological things that they end up being here or there, but it still looks like there's a systematic background information that's always there and that always orients towards this potential migration and all that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have got three more questions and I would like to ask the question makers to, uh, to ask uh, directly. So the first one is from Andrew Dorman. Hey, can you hear me? I'm not sure if I have a good microphone, that's why. You, we can yeah. hear you very well. Okay, good. So, uh, yeah, I was just wondering, I mean, I think how we kind of covered it a little bit then, but whether even the individuals that do reproduce uh, sexually and uh, therefore migrate, are they calcifying during this migration process and therefore like integrating the water column in? In the signal or or might it be that they still do most of the calcification at one depth and then when they it's time for reproduction then they move yeah so it's um it would be great if we could answer that very clearly i think a lot of us <laughs> are very happy um one of the explanation that we could read in uh, a lot of the papers that were published again in the 90s and that's also one of our interpretation is that there's also something else that plays in all that, and that's the fact that by calcifying another chamber, they get a little heavier, a bit more dense, and they might just tend to go down a little bit. So actually, yeah. also what we saw in our paper is that we always have this descending scheme of small ones that would get bigger, 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 and by going bigger, we will find them a bit deeper in the ocean. But we never saw it the other way around, why some people actually said that um, it could be possible that Menardii, for example, and it's also on the graph that's in the background here, that Menardii would actually ascend the water column by getting bigger. That's actually something that we did not see. So we looked at Menardii, but it's not the case. And then for us, at least, uh, which doesn't mean that it wasn't observed before. But yeah, I, I would tend to think that they do record different depth by going deeper, but that it's potentially also linked just to the addition of uh, an extra chamber that makes them heavier. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Very good. And the next question is by Claire. Claire Bert. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. Great. Thank you. And um, it was really just uh, to find out, Julie, if you have a sense of how the coiling direction might fit into um, what you found out so far? Um, I have no answer to this, I was just curious. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, again, that's um, one of the points that we're super lucky with because we had several events. We could try and answer this question with the several events of asexual reproduction that we had and try to see if um, we had more right coding direction, left coding direction, any weird uh, or aberrant coding direction. But for the asexual reproductive event that we saw, every time we were able to look at the coding direction, then all the specimens were turning left for us. 
So I know it wasn't the case for your case, and I think it wasn't the case for the observations of uh, Kimopi. But in our situation, all the asexually spawned uh, specimens ended up turning left. And also in the parent shell that I had, I only had left coiling specimens. OK, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And the uh, next question is by Helen, Helen Coxo. Helen, if you're around, you can ask your question. You yeah. Some... Yeah, very good. I'm, I'm, yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. A fantastic talk, Julie, really interesting. Super interested in the prolocculus sizes, actually. Um, so was it the case that you've just been doing this with pachyderma at the moment? Exactly. Yeah. So far, I just focused on pachyderma. We'll see if yeah. we can do that for other species. That would be great, actually, to train. Yeah. Do you, so do you think this, this, um, this, the, the difference between the proportions of prolocular size and then if it's something to do with asexual versus sexual reproduction proportions, do you think this could be a consequence of the kind of extremely seasonal high latitude mm -hmm. environments? Yeah. Would you see so, something different in the lower latitudes? Is this, a, is this a sort of a strategy for this super seasonality? So, I don't think the seasonality itself will impact the size of the proloculus. However, I do think that the pace or the percentages at which we see the events are related to the fact that it is pachyderma and that pachyderma is living in a very harsh environment um, in a way. And I really think that it's a way for pachyderma to rapidly respond to spring so when food is coming again and all that and then another thing i think it's helping pachyderma with is the fact that we could keep um the juveniles or the offspring that were produced up to six months so we had some living for a really long time and with alternation of phases where they would be active at the chambers and then phases where they would actually not do much and stay what we call dormant so we knew that for a the population in Antarctica that Paki could go dormant, but um, it wasn't sure or specifically described for the population in the Arctic. But I also think that the specimens that are asexually produced for Paki are a way to cope with the winter period. So they will generate these specimens that are that could be more robust because they are arriving to the world already with a larger cytoplasm volume already with one or two chambers that are calcified and then they can go dormant we saw that so maybe that's their way to cope with winter on one hand and then reproduce really fast and efficiently straight after uh, the yeah spring comes back and food comes back and all that uh, super yeah no i'm looking at this that with the uh, quinqualoba actually in the Nordic seas and uh, Arctic, Central Arctic. So it's something I'm really keeping a close eye on. Super fascinating. Yeah, Thank that would yeah, that would definitely be. I mean, Aruka, what she observed was for Uvula. We know that Uvula is more and more found in waters that are not necessarily cold out, but at higher latitude than what we thought before. Um, so I definitely think that there is it is a way to go um, check that for a polar, subpolar species as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you. We have got uh, two more questions, after which I would like to close the discussion. Everybody else can ask your questions to Julie directly. And after the final two questions, there will be some more messages from the organizing committee. So the next question is by, by Catherine Davis. Happy, if you are around. Yeah, hi, Julie. This was such a cool talk. Um, so one of the things I was really curious about is because you did have these multiple observations of sexual and asexual reproduction under different conditions, maybe I was wondering if you were able to identify any environmental triggers for one versus the other, or if you think we might be looking at kind of an obligate alternation of generations. I actually tend to think that it's an obligate thing. So I tried to trigger some things um, more in the north than in the south because I had more forums there. I obviously didn't want to kill the entire populations that I had in culture. So I tried it um, on, I can't remember, maybe 30 specimens that I had. So I tried different things. I tried to change the lights that they were receiving. 
Um, I tried to change the amount of food and the quality of the food. So this is also why I fed them with Artemia and fed them with algae, because I wanted to see if any impact of that would appear. Um, in the south, I tried to starve them to see if um, it could be a reply of starvation. But, um, I never could see that. Right now, there's nothing that I can say. Cool, thank you. Okay, very good. And then we have a final question from Howie. You, Mania. Yeah. What now? Yeah, hi. Um, whoever's talking and uh, mute your, uh, mute your uh, speaker, uh, your microphone. Rohan, I think. Rohan Suva, I think that it's you. <laughs> um, yeah, Julie, one last question. Um, and, you know, I, I've been following the asexual reproduction um, in, in pachyderma from the very first poster that came out that couldn't get published to now where every, we now accept the fact that this is happening in the planktonic forums. Um, Jen Fehrenbacher uh, published a paper a little while ago uh, with colleagues that um, uh, showed a very interesting um, elemental composition of the non-spinose like Neoglobal quadrina deutatri and other uh, species where they had elevated barium for calcium carbonate and calcium carbonate grown in the field and we bring the forearms into the lab, the barium basically goes down the background. And it, the only suggestion that we could come up with was that these non, that some of these non-spinos are using organic aggregates, marine snow, as a habitat surface to live on in the water column. I was wondering if you had done any type of analyses yet on the packies and whether or not there was a difference in the elemental composition between the small and large proloculus packies that could suggest a difference in uh, sort of microhabitat in the water column. Yeah, I think it's super interesting. Um, it's great that you're talking about that because it's, so I'm going back to Norway uh, pretty soon to work again with the people that I worked with for uh, all these events that I saw in the Greenland Sea. And one of the things that we would like to look at um, together with also a postdoc that's in Ireland, Elvin de la Vega, I think he's maybe also online today. So we also would like to see potential interactions with the marine snow. So I want to see if there are interactions, we will collect some pakis, see if there is any paki really breathing in the marine snow or not. Um, and then Elvin is also thinking of um, doing some yeah, isotopes and elemental analysis back in the UK. Uh, probably to look at that. And we have some shells of farm uh, that we could look at for that, but we haven't done it yet. So it's it's definitely something that we're interested in. And I think Elvin is also in contact with Jen about the subject. So because exactly, I mean, she saw that and she also saw really cool things with Duterte and this snowball effect of things that she had. And that's also something that we saw with our culture of Paki um, last year. So again, yeah, I, right now we don't have that, but it's on our to-do list and on the, definitely on the to-do list of some of my Norwegian colleagues. And yeah, we, I think we'll stay in touch with Jen about that, but it's an, yeah, an excellent question and a super interesting thing to look at. Thanks, Julie. I yeah, hope to see you at ICP. Okay, so thank you again, Julie, for the great talk and to everybody for contributing to the very interesting uh, discussion, which I'm sure can continue because you all have Julie's coordinates. If you are interested, you can uh, ask her a question. And uh, at this moment, uh, I would like to pass on to the organizers. Right. Hi. Um, can you see me? Hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good. But well, that was absolutely amazing to uh, start the seminar series off with. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us as well. Um, it's been, you know, it's really positive to see so many of you coming to the meeting. That gives us confidence that it's something that's definitely going to work. Um, so we have at the moment two more meetings planned uh, for the next couple of months. There will be one for August as well, uh, which is finalizing the details for that. So 
in about two weeks time, uh, we get Simon Mitchell um, from Jamaica to talk about the basis for large benthic foraminiferous donation of the Eocene of the Americas. And then in July, on the 29th of July, we have Bruna Diaz, who will talk about beyond shell foraminifera coatings, uh, recording element cycling during past climate changes. So the, the, the Google form for this will be uh, distributed shortly. Then I think it normally takes a little while for a video recording to be finished. So once the, that has kind of been processed by Zoom, uh, we will send out a link to everybody that's registered registered to come to the seminar today and um, so they can um, look at it again if they miss bits or if they couldn't make it um, that they can then still see it basically. Um, and then I think in a couple of months time as well we will probably ask you for your opinions and your feedback about the seminar series um, but then let's first have a couple um, to get rolling really. So again, thank you very much. I hope you all have a fantastic week and uh, see you again in a couple of weeks. See you later, bye. Oh, so there were five people still in the waiting room, including Brian. Yeah, I just want to thank you as well. It was super nice. I'm very happy I could yeah, present my work. Yeah, so that, there was five people that, um, so it's, it's really difficult, right? Sorry, 